Good day, brothers and sisters. It's Sunday once again, and I hope you're ready to worship and praise our Lord and Savior. Now, one of my favorite books in the Bible would be the book of Psalms. And the reason why I love the book of Psalms is because it is a psalm that speaks about our own humanness. I mean, there are so many emotions that you're able to find in the book of Psalms, and you're able to relate to the feelings of the psalmist. Sometimes the psalmist would walk in fear, and sometimes the psalmist would feel uh, a sense of betrayal. Sometimes the, the psalmist is wavering in his faith, and, and so on and so forth. And, and all of these things, this wide spectrum of, of feelings, of human experience, they're all found in the book of Psalms. And one common denominator, however, is that in spite of all that you go through in life, whether you go through dark valleys or mountaintop experiences or storms and hurdles or wars even, the Lord will always be there. And that is why the Lord indeed is our stabilizing, the greatest stabilizing force in our lives. And here we find a Psalm of David, which I would like to share to you, Psalm 27. And he goes, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me, to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. One thing I've asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in His temple. I'd like to stop there this time. And herein we find the many trials, difficulties that David had faced. In fact, he was a man of war. The reason why he was unable or God did not allow him to build the temple was because he was a man of bloodshed. I mean, he was involved in so many wars and he had killed so many men and therefore God did not want him to be the one to build the temple, but rather his own son, Solomon. Now, all throughout those years of wars, obviously his life was constantly under threat. But you know, in spite of the fact that there were times wherein David was fearful of his life, he found solace, comfort, and a shelter and a refuge in God himself. And that is why he declares the Lord to be the Lord who is his light and his salvation. And the result of, of God being the stabilizing force in his life is worship. If you look at verse 4, it says, One thing I've asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. So notice the result of God being the stabilizing force. The result of victory over war is always worship. And that should be true in our lives. Why? Because He is our stabilizing force. And we know that the battle is not ours. The battle belongs to the Lord. And in the Lord, there will always be victory. And so let's worship the Lord at this time. I feel 
I will praise you forever and ever, all of my days, until my last breath. Oh Lord, I have come to praise you and lift up your name above.
Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Great news everyone, we already have three weekend services. Every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the Sabana service and two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the English services. The title of our sermon is A Tale of Two Sons. We'll take our text from Matthew 21, verses 28 to 32. Let us read this passage. But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, Go work today in the vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. The man came to the second and said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And they said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you, that the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him. And you, seeing this, did not even feel remorse afterward so as to believe in him. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we Thank you and bless you, O God, for this wonderful Sunday that you've given us, O God, that we might be able to worship you and bless you. And today, once again, as we study your word, allow our minds and our hearts to be engaged fully. And I pray, Lord, that we might submit ourselves to your will. We pray for the blessing, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that your name might be glorified in our midst. Lord, we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, as always, there will always be two general responses to Christ. One would be rejection and the other one would be faith in Christ. Now, this parable that we will be studying invites us to think what kind of a son we are. This is actually the story of two sons. And herein we find not only the importance of the will of God, but likewise the importance of submitting ourselves to God's will. Most especially His will for our own salvation. Remember the Bible says that He does not desire for anyone to perish, but for all to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. This is the desired will of God. However, we know that there would be some people who would be persuaded and submit themselves to the will of God, but there are others who, in spite of God's powerful persuasion, will still reject the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have here, a two-point study. In the first part, we're going to talk about the parable of dissimilar sons in verses 28 to 30. In verse 28 and 29, we find the repentant son. And then in verse 30, the hypocritical son. And then we're going to look at the second point, which is the identification of dissimilar sons. You have the dregs of society, which really would represent the repentant son in verse 31. And then you have the religious leaders, which really speak of the hypocritical son in verse 32. So let's unpack our study today and let's talk about the parable of dissimilar sons in verses 28 to 30. And so let's talk about the repentant son, first of all, 
in verse 28 and 29. It says, But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in the vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and he went. So in this parable, Jesus gives a uh, parable in relation to two kinds of people and their responses. And in verses 28 to 29, I'm actually reminded of the two thieves that were nailed together with the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross. And what had happened, if you will look at the previous uh, Gospels, what you discover there is that both of these thieves actually were railing and they were, in fact, mocking the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and so both of them were antagonistic towards the Lord Jesus. And they were saying all sorts of bad things against the Lord. But interestingly, and I don't know what really happened, we know that the Lord Jesus must have been at the cross for about maybe three hours or maybe even more. And the thing is, there was a change of heart on one of the thieves. And if you recall, he asked the Lord Jesus Christ that he might be included in his kingdom. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, today, you shall be with me in paradise. I also find the example of the Roman soldier who, when the Lord Jesus Christ gave up his spirit, said, truly, this is the Son of God. And so there are some people who initially would seemingly reject the sovereign will of God. And yet, by the empowering and conviction of the Holy Spirit, they have a change of heart. And this is exactly what you and I will see in verses 28 to 29, a change of heart on the part of the first son. So again, in this parable, you have a father who had two sons, and he goes to the first one, and he tells him to work. Incidentally, the word work here is in the present imperative and therefore is a command to work and keep on working. So in this particular case, the first son represents the scum and the dregs of society who did not seem to be willing in following the will of the Father, which was to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 29, it represents those who were obvious sinners but surprisingly accepted Jesus as the Messiah. And in this particular passage, we find great hope, actually, because there are indeed some people who seem to be so hardened, so stubborn, that when you share the gospel, you think that they will not only immediately reject the gospel, but that they too will continually... Uh, drift away from the Lord and continually reject the gospel. But then again, God is almighty and all-powerful and He can change the hardest of human hearts, the most stubborn of hearts. And therefore, we find great hope. And that is why we should not be discouraged when we share the gospel, most especially to people who do not seem to be inclined to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. I recall the story of uh, some fraternity members. Uh, there was this young lady who was a Christian and she shared to these fraternity members. And probably she was very insistent and very persistent. And what happened was that these fraternity members got so annoyed and so irritated with her that they violently kicked her and beat her up. But in spite of that, there was no harboring of bitterness on the part of this young lady who was sharing the gospel. The result of that, if my memory serves me right, is that there were many of these fraternity members who came to a saving knowledge 
of Jesus Christ. And again, here would be a very powerful example of people who are definitely stubborn, definitely hardened in their hearts, but God miraculously performs a miracle so that their hearts towards Christ are changed. Anyway, we move towards the second son. And in verse 30, we discover the hypocritical son. It says in verse 30, the man came to the second and said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. So the second son here represents the religious leaders who seem to be more promising to do the will of the Father, to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, since after all, they had studied the scriptures well and they were under the mentorship of the best rabbis in Jerusalem. So with all the knowledge they had with the Old Testament and with all the training that they received in their rabbinical schools, you would think that when the Lord Jesus Christ appears on the scene, they would immediately respond and they would immediately identify Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one and the savior of the world. But you and I know that they were so spiritually blind that they were unable to recognize Jesus as the Christ and savior of the world. And this is so unfortunate because they were the religious and intellectual elite of that society. And having been learned in the things of God, having been learned in the Old Testament scriptures, you would expect so much more from them. But then, in, but then again, we find that instead of finding sufficiency in Christ, they found sufficiency in themselves and in their own righteousness. They were blinded into thinking that their righteousness was enough to bring salvation and to bring them into God's kingdom. Now, this tells us that even with the best spiritual or religious inputs that we will receive, we will not arrive at truth if our hearts are not right. So ultimately, it's not about our brains. It's not about our intelligence quotient. But rather, it is about a true seeking heart, a sincere heart, a heart that is open to what God reveals. And this is exactly what we discover in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 13. It says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. For as long as we seek him with our whole heart, we will definitely find the Lord. And this is what God is looking for after all. Which reminds me of another story, the man called Sadhu Sundar Singh. Sadhu Sundar Singh, by the way, is considered as the greatest evangelist that India ever had. And one of the trademarks of this man, Sadhu Sundar Singh, is that he was someone who walked barefoot and walked the streets and towns and provinces of India sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just like our Lord and Savior, he suffered a lot in the hands of men. And yet, he persevered and continued to share the gospel that had radically changed his life. Well, I'd like to share to you his salvation story. Well, he belonged to the highest Indian caste, and he was considered as a sadhu, a holy man. And one of the things that he actually did was to burn Bibles in a particular school. And he was so opposed to the Christian faith that he would do certain things to oppose Christianity. Now, the thing was, in spite of the fact that he had achieved great heights in his own Hindu religion, he still felt this emptiness deep down inside. And so, one night, 
when he was so empty and so lost, he began to think about the possibility that Jesus might really be the one he claims to be, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, God himself. And so in great desperation, Sadhu cried out to the Lord and said, Jesus, if you are really God, show yourself to me. Because if you will not show yourself to me tonight, I will go to the railway station and I will lie by the rails, have myself run over by a train. I am so desperate. Please, if you are God, show yourself to me. Now, I do not, of course, recommend that we do what Sadhu Sundar Singh did. I mean, there are different strokes for different people and we have to understand that God has various dealings with us. But in this particular case, God saw beyond all that he was saying and, and God saw his heart, a heart that was truly desperate in finding out the truth. And so a miracle took place because this was a prayer that Sadhu prayed inside his room. And what happened was miraculous. There was this ball of light, this small ball of light that became bigger and bigger and bigger. And out of that ball of light was the Lord Jesus Christ who, like in the encounter that uh, Paul had in the Damascus Road revealed himself to Sadhu. And from that time on, he submitted himself to the Lordship of Christ. Well, he went through a lot of suffering. He was even poisoned by his own father. But, praise be to God, he was able to survive that poisoning and he continued to share the gospel. Indeed, friends, when your heart is seeking, when your heart is genuinely determined to find out the truth, you will find out the truth. And once again, take comfort in this promise coming from the Lord. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Now, sadly, the religious leaders of that time were nothing like this. They were not seeking the Lord just like Sadhu. And in the end, they were the ones who not only rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, they were responsible for the death and the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior. And all throughout their lives, they continually opposed Christianity. Thank God that even while Paul was part of this religious group, he eventually repented because of that Damascus Road experience. So let's move on and let's talk about the identification of the dissimilar sons in verses 31 to 32. And so let's talk about the dregs of society, the repentant son in verse 31. It says, which of the two did the will of the father? And they said, the first. And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you that the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. As always, to begin an introspective process, Jesus asks them a question so that they themselves would draw conclusions from the parable itself. Being the master teacher that Jesus is, Jesus engages the mind because the mind is the battleground. This is the reason why he asked the question, which of the one which of the two, rather, did the will of the Father? Again, he wants to engage our minds because the mind is the battleground. And whoever wins the mind will be able to bring that person into submission to his will. And sadly, there are some people who, because of the hardness of their hearts, because of the stubbornness of their minds, they have now submitted themselves to the will of Satan, the father of lies. But then again, allow me to just, you know, speak about a little sidebar in this particular case because the mind is so important. Again, that's the reason why Jesus asked the question. 
In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And then in Ephesians 4.23, it says, And that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And then in Colossians uh, chapter 3, uh, it says, And have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. And Paul himself in writing to the Corinthians said, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And so once again, we find that the mind is the battleground. And we have to be very, very careful about the inputs that enter into our minds. And let it be that the inputs that we receive would be the things of God. For after all, Paul himself exhorted the Philippian believers to let their mind dwell on things that are beautiful, things that are good, things that are noble, things that are excellent. The Philippian saints were to dwell on these things. And again, friends, it is very important, most especially if the Lord Himself is engaging our minds through the Holy Spirit, we are to allow ourselves to be truly introspective and truly humble, even to unlearn certain things that we have learned before. Because after all, it is the truth that will set us free. Now, the conversation here in verse 31 happens to be in the Greek historical present, and Matthew wants us to imagine that we are first-hand witnesses. The question that Jesus is asking here is therefore relevant for us. We are likewise to be introspective. We need to ask the question, what kind of a son am I? Am I the first son, the repentant one, or the second one? the hypocritical one. God wants us to be able to process this. And that is why, friends, by the way, for those of you who are Bible readers, the Bible is never intended for speed reading. The Bible is intended for quiet, slow meditation. We are to study every single word because as the Bible says, not a single word from the scriptures uh, will disappear until all shall be fulfilled. And that is why it is very important to process everything that is being taught to us by the Spirit of God and by the Word of God. Now, in this particular passage, Jesus declared to these religious leaders that sinners would go ahead of them in the matter of salvation. We're talking about the tax gatherers, the prostitutes, the so-called evil men. They are the ones who would enter into salvation. And as seems to be the case in general, the obvious sinners are quite easier to bring to the Lord Jesus Christ than those who are religious because, after all, they're very aware and conscious about their own sinfulness and wickedness. And I would like to testify that here, a living word, we thank God that by the grace of God and through His working, many of those so-called obvious sinners have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. One of the people who had come to a saving knowledge in our church is known by the name Eli Tabar. Eli Tabar is the leader of the Alega Gang. And incidentally, this was made into a movie. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the role of Eli Tabar was taken or rather uh, played by Robin Padilla himself. I'd like you to know that Eli Tabar happens to be one of our full-time ministers. And he ministers 
uh, as an evangelist in the prison ministries all over Visayas. And he has been used mightily of God. And this, this guy was, you know, he was a hard target. He was one of the most wanted men in Cebu in the 1980s. And yet today, he is faithfully serving the Lord. One of our former workers was also a snatcher in Colon. Very good snatcher, by the way. And this person became one of our full-time workers who served in one of our provinces. Then one of our uh, band members, uh, one of our music musicians, his name is Glenn Almasan. He used to be a drugs dealer and a gun runner. That was the kind of life that this, uh, this musician of ours was living. And if you looked at him before, he, he really looked so much like an addict, very thin and very gaunt eyes. And yet right now, he is faithfully serving the Lord with our worship team. And way back um, in the 1980s or even in the late 70s, uh, the NPAs were very strong in, in the province of Cebu. In fact, they had the Sparrow Unit. And in the Sparrow Unit, there were many policemen who were killed. And not only that, there were some uh, influential targets who were also killed. Well, the head of the Sparrow unit goes by the name of Beth Caballero. And he just recently uh, passed away a few years back. But he was the leader of the Sparrow unit of the NPA. This guy became a full-time worker of ours and had served in ministry for the longest time. And if you recall, if some of you were born uh, in the 70s and in the 80s, you probably recall the fact that Talisay City used to, be the, used to be called the killing fields of Cebu because a lot of people were being killed by the Sparrow Unit. That was the time, by the way, I came here as a local missionary. And in a meeting with pastors, we were even shown a hit list. Because I was new to the place, I was not part of the hit list. But there were some well-known pastors who were part of that hit list. And many of them were so scared because they knew that they would probably be next. But you know what? The Lord arrested the heart of Beth Caballero and he became a full-time minister and served together with us for a long, long time. We also used to have a, a team which was called the Sure Cure Team. And this was composed of former drug addicts and they went out sharing the gospel. Incidentally, one of those people, his name was Al Capone. And of course, you and I know that he was the famous Italian gangster. And one of the members had that name. We also had a worker who used to be a gay bar dancer. And so if you look at many of the workers of our church, the living word, you have an all-star team of obvious sinners. And yet, friends, just like what had happened in the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, these men were converted and they were used mightily of God. Indeed, God's word is powerful. And God's word through Jesus Christ has been fulfilled even during our day and our time. And I believe that it will continue to be fulfilled until God takes us home. Now, in verse 32, we're going to talk about the religious leaders, the hypocritical son. In verse 32, it says, For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and he was addressing the religious leaders. And it says, And you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him. And you, seeing this, did not even feel remorse afterward so as to believe him. Now, because of these people's response to John the Baptist, we're talking about the people who are tax collectors. Because of these tax collectors' response, 
to John the Baptist, they would definitely respond to Jesus Christ as well. And so this is what the Lord is teaching here in verse 32, that because they were open to John the Baptist, they would be open to Jesus and they would receive Jesus. Jesus was prophesying, in fact, that these sinners would accept him because of their favorable response to John the Baptist. Now, the religious, however, are hard to bring because they feel that they are self-sufficient, self-righteous, and that they do not need Jesus. And this has always been the case. The most difficult people to bring to the Lord would be the people who do not recognize that they are sinners. I recall one time there was a pastor who was invited in a talk show, and it so happened that the TV hostess was a very famous one, and she was interviewing the pastor at that time. And the pastor made mention of the fact that we are all sinners. And guess what this hostess said? She said, excuse me, I am not a sinner. And I guess that is the thinking of most religious leaders, that they are not sinners. But friends, let me tell you this. You cannot have a Savior unless you first of all acknowledge that you need saving. And to acknowledge that you need saving, you need to be able to declare and confess that you are a sinner and that you need to repent of that. And then ask Jesus to be the one to cleanse, wash, and save you. Otherwise, friends, you will continue to wallow in your self-righteousness. And the end is something that you will probably, you will definitely not like. Because you will wake up in a Christless eternity. And a Christless eternity means the lake of fire forever. So, let me just pause at this time and let me ask you the same question that Jesus asked. Which of the two sons are you? If you happen to be someone who thinks that you are a sinner and that there is no hope for you, I'm here to tell you that there is hope for all men. Because salvation is not through our good works. Salvation is through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And just like in the case of the Jews who looked at the serpent that Moses asked them to look at in the same way that they were healed from the poison of snakes, you and I would be healed from the poison of our sinfulness if we fix our eyes on Jesus and make him the author and the finisher of our faith. Through him, we have salvation. And friends, let me just tell you this. Just because a person carries the label religion does not mean he can be trusted. You need to look deeper and you will see a person as he really is. And as soon as you discover what he really is, and in this particular case, we're talking about the religious leaders, stay away from them because their itinerary will bring you straight to hell. But like the other son, the son who repents, may that be the kind of son you are. I pray this message will bring home the message of salvation to your heart and that you might just bow your knee and bow your heart before our Savior and say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. I need to be saved. I need your salvation. And the Lord will immediately grant that to you, writing your name in the book of life, never ever to be erased. And He will change you from inside out and you will become the person that God wants you to be. In the same way that God transformed the dregs and the scum of Cebu society, that too can happen to you. 
and friends, you might think that, well, I'm not as bad as they are. Well, friends, that is from a human standpoint. In the eyes of God, we are all dirty and filthy sinners. In fact, the Bible says our righteous deeds are nothing but filthy rags in the sight of God. And so, could you at this time come before the Lord, pray to Him, pray something like this, Lord, I just realized right now that I am a sinner and that your standard is so high. Your standard is perfection. And Lord, you know I can never, ever be perfect. So Lord, I will not rely on myself. I will not rely on my good works because my good works will not save me. Jesus, you are the only one who can save my soul. You are the only one who died for my sins. And so Jesus, I make you my Lord and Savior today. Now, if you pray something like that, and you pray that sincerely from the bottom of your heart, friend, your name will be written in the book of life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And thank you, Lord, for what you have done today. We trust that there has been a harvest of souls. And Lord, we give you back the glory, the praises, and thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. So friends, God bless you. And again, just to remind you, please hit the notification bell and subscribe to our YouTube channel, our Facebook page. Please spread the word of God all over the world so that more might come to Christ. And friends, don't forget, we're nationwide on TV and radio as well. God bless you. Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu International Incorporated and our website, www.livingword.ph and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Good news, brothers and sisters. Our radio program will now be heard nationwide through FEBC radio stations. As an added bonus, all Living Word original songs will likewise be aired as well. So, if you would like to listen to our radio program, we're coming out in the following stations. 702 DZAS AM, broadcasting from Pasig every Sunday, 11 AM to 11.30 in the morning. We're also coming out from 104.3 DWAY FM from Legaspi. This is also every Sunday from 10 to 10.30 in the morning. And for those of you in Tacloban, we're coming out from 97.5 DYFE FM every Monday from 11.30 in the morning to 12 p.m. For those of you in Sambuanga, we are coming out from our station in 1116 DXAS AM every Sunday from 11.30 to 12 p.m. Also, for those of you in Davao, we're coming out from 1197 DXFE AM every Sunday from 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 2.30 p.m. For those of you in Coronadal, we're also coming out from Station 1062 DXKI AM every Saturday from 8 to 8.30 p.m. And for those of you in Cagayan de Oro, we're coming out from 103.3 DXJL FM every Sunday from 8 to 8.30 p.m. 
And for those of you from Metro Cebu, we're coming out from 98.7 DYFR FM every Saturday and Sunday from 8 to 9 p.m. Please tell your friends about this and tune in to our radio program. Let us pray that God might use this radio program to become a blessing to as many people as possible. God bless you all. Great news, everyone. We already have three weekend services every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the Sabana service and two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the English services. We'd also like to thank our partners, our members who have been consistently giving to partner with us in the work of the Lord. We'd like to share our giving channels to those who would like to partner with us in the work of the Lord. You can deposit your love offerings to the following banks. Banco de Oro. Account name is LWCCCII. The account number is 001-0000068800. We also have a BPI account. Account name is Living Word Christian Ministries, Cebu Incorporated. Account number is 10210234811. Finally, we have RCBC. Account name is LWCCCII. Account number is 1452005286. To give via GCash, just follow these simple steps. From your GCash app, click Bank Transfer. In Bank Transfer, click the BDO icon under Select Partner Banks. Enter the amount. Enter the name LWCCCII and account number 001-0000060800 and send the receipt to office at livingword.ph Then click Send Money. You may also send your love offerings and donations online through our website. Go to www.livingword.ph and click Give and then a dialog box comes out of it. Kindly click on your giving preferences. Thank you and God bless.